just rub it in. I could have like actually overlooked that, but now, now it's right in front of my face. Just choke on. Just finished. Just finished dinner. Just digging into a little dessert. Uh, I, you know, if I don't stop the call when I hear you choking on that later, I, you know. But, uh, <laughs> nice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, yesterday, um, I'll share this since we have to, you know, waste the first obligate, you know, like obligatorily waste the first uh, three minutes or so. I, I tried a, well, it was like a chili popsicle. So I think I had cayenne pepper and uh, some pineapple chunks and something. And so, um, yeah, I was really, really out there on a limb. I think, I think it's, it's dangerous. I don't know if I'd brave a chili popsicle. Yeah. <laughs> It doesn't really sound like dessert. Oh, right. I mean, throw some sugar in it. It'll be fine. Jim, Jim, there's uh oh yeah, it is it is blue shirt blue shirt Thursday. The thing is, is uh you know, this is like this is like a pre There you go. Pre QCon QCon type deal. This is uh this thing used to, you know, back when this thing like used to fit. Now, now I can barely <laughs> see. Always better to be too big than too small, right? So. Why don't you come have a, a chat with my wife? Tell tell her that. She'll, uh... <laughs> I just uh, bought a, a bunch of shirts which were one size bigger and a bunch of labels which are one size smaller. Stitch them in. It's exactly the same size. I've never not changed. That's a good uh, thing. Use that. All right. Well, <clears throat> welcome all. We're going to get rolling in about a minute. Um, the meeting minutes um, are posted in the Zoom chat. Be sure to jump in and plop your name in there if you would. Some of us might even be able to make some new friends today. I mean, we've got some, some old faces and some new faces. So this, this is great. I would just say ice cream always helps the social network, right? So. Well, very good. Um, Amy is with us, I believe. Uh, Ken is with us, I think. Yep. And Mr. Klein is there. And we're about four after. Uh, let's get rolling. Thanks, everyone, for, for coming today. It's nice to have a few of you fresh. Uh, so good. So if you haven't been on a CNCF SIG network call before, or really a CNCF SIG call, um, this one's not much different than the rest. And we do adhere to, uh, well, hopefully adhere to CNCF uh, cultural values, but, but also just in terms of um, recording these uh, calls and posting them publicly, uh, we do that. Um, we ask that you be respectful on, on the call. Um, I'm excited about um, today's agenda. Um, it's actually most of the time that we get to meet that, um, that I get to be excited. A lot of times we're looking at um, really interesting projects, um, nearly all of which end up 
um, inside of the CNCF at, um, at various levels. Uh, there's a number of you on the call that represent those very projects. Um, and so um, if you're, you know, just also we gave a, at this last KubeCon EU, we gave a, an intro and a deep dive and Matt Klein and Ken Owens, um, who are um, co-chairs on uh, SIG Network, um, have helped, have uh, given those, uh, I think we've given them a couple of times now. Um, uh, our, our initial one was, um, had a little bit of what today's theme will have, which is the overarching theme of today is a call for participation. Um, so you'll probably hear me say that uh, a couple of times. Um, last time that we met, uh, so we, we missed the beat, I think, because last time we were going to meet was during KubeCon week. And during KubeCon week, you, you just KubeCon. Uh, and so, uh, but the time that we met before that, we had discussed a couple of times over the notion that there were a number of topics and kind of work streams forming um, specific to service mesh topics. And we, I think we discussed what some of those were in, in this call. Some of them, um, we wanna discuss um, what those look like today and part of the charter of the service mesh working group. Last time we met, we had agreed that um, that our core agenda for the SIG network um, had dwindled down to leave enough space to use this same meeting time for um, service mesh working group. Um, that's subject to change based on future needs to do project reviews or other topics that come up for the SIG network in general. So the SIG network is not, doesn't only just look at service mesh things, but um, but that's today's focus kind of in context of uh, a subgroup, the service mesh working group. Um, we want to in introduce that today and talk about some of the work streams and really, again, like an overarching theme here is to solicit interest in the projects that are presented as well as um, potentially projects that aren't listed. So um, Matt or Ken, anything that we want to do we want to note before we take a look at the service mesh working group slides? I'm going to let's let's dig in then. Fair enough. All right. So, hey, the, the service mesh working group. Um, by the way, just uh, I think um, you know th this this the the call that we're on right now. It's it's got a, a few enough people that I'm hopeful that it becomes pretty interactive. So please don't please don't treat this as a formal call. Um, anything you say will be recorded and posted, but that's not the the point. Um, the point is this: um, Thank you for coming today. If you like what you see, please come back. Please um, express opinion, bring ideas. Uh, help, help, uh, help shape what we use this Lee, hour for. Yeah. The quick question. Um, so you're just not going to give a monologue then? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I just want to make sure. Just trying to break that a little bit. Yeah. No. Thanks, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so we're fortunate that there of the three pro uh, four-ish project that, projects that we'll talk about today, um, you guys will hear from others um, and not just me, which is, which is nice. Moreover, as they come up, please just interrupt like, like uh, Steve did. Uh, so so there's, there's a couple of, uh, couple of things around service meshes that um, there's a collection of you that have been either asking on about or working on. And, and we're trying to help uplift those, project, those efforts, um, shine a light on some of them, and um, bring others to bear on them, to influence them. So to Steve's point, like not just you know, questions and comments, but like influencing and, and directing. And so there's, uh, um, of the projects that we're about to talk about, um, which, I, which we could either refer to them as projects or maybe work streams, um, I think today, today we're gonna, um, they'll be introduced uh, and they won't really be advanced because it'll be about introducing them and, and making sure that people are understanding the, their vision and, and whether or not you want to get involved and do things there. Um, 
so at the end of the call, we'll do again kind of a, a call for interested parties, and we'll figure out how to um, how to have um, times in which we can go fairly deep. A lot a lot of things can be done asynchronously in terms of advancing these projects. There's some commonalities across them. Um, one of those is the, the notion that the CNCF lab is uh, an excellent resource, particularly for um, as we look at well, things that, you know, anything at scale, doing tests at scale, a lot of times that has to do with performance. Um, and that's, um, I don't know, it, arguably an underused resource, maybe. Um, it's been well used um, in a number of instances a lot of very interesting um, analyses have come out of uh, the use of those labs. So I expect that those labs will be used for a couple of the projects here. Um, ideally, that those labs and the, the analysis of them, there a lot of times these are point in time things, software changes. And so, so should you maybe run a test again or do an analysis again to the extent that um, you know people consider that it's warranted. So. I wanted to call out that resource. And part of the goals of these initiatives are, are in fact, to, to publish a few things. Um, some of that's either, whether that's analysis or maybe whether that's service mesh patterns. So, so this, um, as a topic uh, unto its own, is of personal interest to me, and I know it's of personal interest to others that are on this call. Um, there was a, um, if, if folks are familiar with Paul Bauer of Microsoft, um, he had been really interested in this space um, before and been trying to help organize an effort around identifying patterns, documenting them, sharing them um, in a vendor neutral way. And I'm, I'm really biased. I think that this is a great venue for vendor neutral stuff. Um, and I think, you know, so does he. Um, I've been pinging him. I think that that effort might have um, puttered out, but I'm hopeful that it will pick it pick up. I'm hopeful that um, any number of you or others will participate in this. Um, th this is to say that um, there's any number of service meshes, by the way. There's like 20 plus or more. Depends on how you want to count. Depends on if you count different distributions of Istio as individual ones or not. Um, uh, but people it's fairly obvious, I think, to everyone on this call that, that um, you know, between different service meshes, they can be used for common purposes. They can also be used for different purposes. Not all of them are built toward the exact same vision or toward the exact same goals. Um, if they were, we would probably have less in the world. And I, for my part, I anticipate that we will have less in the world at some point. Um, I would expect, um, like a couple of others on this call, that before this year is over, there will be more in the world, not less. So um, the call to action here, the call to interest here around patterns is to um, help achieve part of the charter of the CNCF SIG network, which is to, um, to inform um, broadly. And that would, in this case, this is informing by uh, providing um, reference. Uh, I don't know what other word to use other than patterns, I guess, but like uh, references of common uses uh, of this tech and the patterns by which they're used. And I know, um, uh, well, Nick Jackson, you're, you're on the call here. I know this is of kind of a particular uh, focus for you and to not make this a monologue. Um, a different way that you would characterize this or maybe certain examples you might give to help get people's... Um... Well, I think, I think the thing is about patterns. It's about looking at the common tasks which people uh, want to use a service mesh for. Because ultimately, I think what we're trying to do with service mesh is move basically network reliability code and network observability and network security code which has spent a lot of time inside of the application and move it out. But, but conceptually, whether the, the, that, that sort of logic is in the service mesh or whether it's in the app, you're trying to do the same thing. You're trying to maybe smoothly balance the routing between different services. You, you kind of want to implement, um, I don't know, like layer specific routing. You want to do things like um, 
managing sort of load balancing to to caches you you want to be able to handle reliability that, that you have with with unreliability that you get from sort of dispute systems and networks and dynamic systems in general and the, the core thing about that is that we're doing the same thing so we're trying to do canary deployments where we're trying to ensure that there's um, blow off of, you know, like pressure cooker, safety valves, circuit breaking on our services so that we don't end up with sort of critical um, cascading crashes. Uh, we're trying to do things like sort of balance traffic across regions. We're trying to fail traffic over to regions and manage it across multiple different clouds. And, and those, I think those patterns really can be distilled down to, I mean, there's probably quite a few of them, but you know, you, you have that, um, that sort of commonality and it doesn't matter regardless of what industry you're working in or, or which service mesh you choose, um, there is that commonality. Now, I believe that by educating people on the patterns of use, it, it really helps people move forward distributed systems. Um, and, and I'm very, very, very passionate about, about this. Um, so th on that particular topic, it's, it's um, a general call for interest and participation. So the so do signal if those are of interest, if whether you're help, wanting to help produce those or identify them, work through them, or just be a consumer of them, provide feedback. Um, there'll be sort of ongoing discussion and work there. And that's in part because there's a lot of service meshes. Um, Nick, you and I were talking about about this a little bit earlier, do you want to? Yeah, and and I think there's, as I said, kind of like it's a it's a common problem that everybody has. I, I genuinely think that the service mesh or the the kind of patterns which go into a service mesh is going to be in any distributed application. When when it comes to abstractions, they're they're becoming increasingly um, important because you need a way to think and rationalize across different different service meshes. So things like SMI is trying to do that. It's trying to take a sort of a, a rational approach, which says, look, instead of this very specific YAML for, for controlling traffic routing on, on brand X of service mesh and a very different method for brand Y, what we're going to try and do is, is consolidate a consistent practitioner experience and operator experience by saying, this is how it's, it's, it's an abstraction and interface layer into the underlying implementation. And an SMI's kind of growth around that and, and thinking first, you know, just about the kind of the core workflows, but hopefully like expanding it out to be more encompassing is really going to help the practitioner because as a practitioner, you're probably going to find that you change jobs. You're working with a different mesh or a different cloud or a different set of technologies. The easier that we can make maintaining and holding knowledge of, of service mesh operation the more that it's going to benefit the, the the kind of progression in that area and kind of on a on a kind of similar vein to that you've got to be thinking about performance and this is really important for a number of different reasons but um service mesh performance is another working group which is inside the the cncf which is looking at how you can kind of describe and manage um, mesh performance and we'll, we'll look at that a little bit on the next slide but then you've also got connectivity now CNCF's own statistics and, and many other statistics, including Gartner, are kind of showing that a high number of people are operating in a multi-cloud world or they're operating heterogeneous environments. And they do that for a number of different reasons. They, they do it through acquisition because they want to sort of do developer choice, because they, they want to be able to kind of balance, um, you know, hedging their bets across multiple clouds or taking advantages of various different costs. But the key thing is that we want to be able to connect all of that together. So VMware has a specification called Hamlet, which is an open source specification currently looking at CNCF. And the idea around that is looking at a common interface method to manage things like catalogs, uh, synchronization between the different meshes and identity federation. So it's, uh, it's, it's gonna be a, a really nice to hopefully see a standard at the forefront that you're gonna get Istio and LinkedIn, Istio and console, VMware, Tanzu, and uh, console um, uh, sort of um, mesh and uh, Kuma, everybody being able to integrate together. Uh, why that benefits, it benefits the, the practitioner and, and also it'll benefit the vendors because they're no longer being constrained on, on integration. People can choose the right tool for the right job. Um, 
the pop-up near me, Sonia. So service mesh interface conformance is a project which has just been picked up by the um, CNCF. And, and the intention around this is to be able to say, right, we're, we're going to bet on the SMI as the, the method of, of kind of defining an in, uh, interaction with a service mesh. And it, it's actually important to, to understand which of the service meshes adhere to the various different sort of capabilities of SMI. So for example, um, policy-based routing or, or just kind of um, traffic splitting, traffic routing. So SMI conformance is, is going to be a project which looks at that and it'll, it'll be able to run automation against the um, service meshes which are subscribing to, um, uh, to, to be included in there and, and also to, to kind of be able to kind of say, right, you know, this particular mesh implements these features, it implements those. Again, it's about the ability to provide consumers the ability to make the correct decision for them and, and do so in an easy uh, in, in an easy way. Layer 5 um, and uh, Meshery is, is kind of working around the sort of the, the particular tooling to facilitate that. And um, it, it's pretty exciting. I'm, I think it's a really great thing to be able to benefit with SMI as well. Hopefully promote hey. and push that standard. Is this service mesh interface conformance the same as the service mesh performance you talked about, or are they? No, they're one of the same. Just, oh, okay. Two, okay, two different things. Yeah, sorry. Um, so interface conformance is basically does this mesh implement this particular interface? Um, SMP, which uh, can you flip a slide there, Lieber? Please, uh, is all about okay. providing a kind of a standard way of measuring the various different outputs and, and performance capabilities of a service mesh. Now, why do you want to do that? Well, you know, benchmarking is one thing, but there's a number of reasons why you need to be able to benchmark. You, you want to be able to benchmark to understand a change or a potential change that you're going to make into a system. I think one of the things that will take time to, when, when you start being educated is that, you know, service mesh is not free. Now, I can't give you numbers, but potentially you could, if you're running layer seven right through your stack, you're doing things like inspecting HTTP headers, you're, you're kind of double buffering a lot of that request information into memory as you process it, et cetera, et cetera. That takes CPU, it's, um, it's memory. You could find by switching layer seven inspection across your entire service mesh, it increases your CPU and memory counts and, and overall sort of resource consumption by 10%. Now, as, a, as an operator, you want to be able to make a decision based on that because increased consumption is increased cost. Do you really need that, that capability right through the, the network? Do you just need it in bits and pieces? Service mesh performance is, through, through one of the goals, is going to be able to enable people to better make that choice. For vendors, what vendors can do is vendors can leverage service mesh performance to, to be able to run things like regression tests across the various different versions of their software, which benefits them. It helps them to, to kind of keep... Um, keep on track and ensure that they're, they're sort of keeping performance and all of the tooling be there for them to do that. But it also benefits the consumer because that index benchmarking can be used to, to, to educate. Now, again, like one of the goals of SMP is to compare apples and apples. It's no good comparing the, the speed and performance of like a layer four TCP connection to a mesh connection, which is running on layer seven, because there is a definitive speed and performance overhead of the you know, uh, degradation on the ladder. So SMP is designed to, to kind of measure things accurately and comparatively. The other thing that, that kind of SMP is going to enable, we hope is, is a, sort of the, a variety of plugin ecosystems. So the ability for the likes of, let's say Datadog as a SaaS platform to be able to provide specific um, service mesh metrics and to be able to do so by kind of just consuming um, the, uh, an interface which implements the performance um, specification. And yeah, and, and the hope around this again is um, a universal performance index, which is kind of gauge um, efficiency and efficacy. It's important for the consumer to have the choice. They, they want to be able to make a balance of decision between feature and speed. It, it's kind of, not everybody has exactly the same requirements. Not everybody has the same requirement in the same application, really. So um, big hopes for SMP to, to be able to make some headway and get some standardization in that space.
As people digest that and, and, and formulate questions and comments, I'll, I'll toss in this, this perspective that, uh, well, I guess in general, a perspective that I think a lot of times we see in our, our industry that infrastructure gets somewhat commoditized. And in just in a, from, a my, from a myopic perspective of a service mesh, if you're looking at a data plane, a control plane, a management plane, that those lower planes would get commoditized kind of over time. If we sort of watch the history of, uh, of some of how infrastructure runs, or at least from my perspective, um, I don't, I see in a lot of respects, the opposite happening um, here, that the data plane um, can be quite intelligent. As a matter of fact, um, efforts that some of you are on this call are directly helping with in and around pluggable filters, whether those are WebAssembly or, or other, or, or native to the project, um, means that you can ask even more of a service mesh, and it can be even more dynamic to the extent that those are dynamically pluggable. And so the, like, the ability to, for, for people, for us, to use common nomenclature, um, and a way of sort of exchanging a format to say that, you know, to, to discuss how much it costs to run a, a more highly intelligent piece of infrastructure or how much you're saving in terms of the time that it would have taken to perform that task otherwise. Or from my perspective, uh, uh, it, this actually becomes more important over time as data planes are fairly powerful today and, and potentially get even more so going forward. C comments on this? C questions on this? Spec. Jim, your note on the difference between SMI and SMP, good note or good, good uh, common question. So, like, when you hear about it on the surface, I think. I'm um, highly complimentary the two um, in so much as one SMI facilitates a standard interface for invoking for describing a traffic split, for example, while the other one provides a standard um, way, a standard unit of measure um, of, it, of that traffic splits performance. And so. Okay. Hey, so, so I took a quick look at the, the SMP site that's linked on this page. And so is it not part of CNCF today? Like, is it a standalone effort? Because it shows, you know, contributors CNCF, which makes me think, okay, so it's an independent project, not part of CNCF. Can you, I guess, help me position a little bit to understand that? Yeah, good, good, good question. The hope is, is, is that uh, in a couple of weeks, this becomes a CNCF project in part. Um, uh, yep, so, it's not, so to be concise, it's not today. And okay. those partners that you see listed are in agreements that, that we want to we bring it over here. Got it. Um, and, and that it's, um, well, I don't know how you quite gauge this. It's uh, relatively young in its life cycle of its development, you know, I guess uh, that part of, um, it, it's a, a concept that's been around for quite some long time. This uh, got, got started uh, really, uh, really in the Istio um, performance and scalability um, work group. Um, as a, I don't think, you know, it wasn't called this then, but, but there was an acknowledgement that th such a thing would be really helpful. There was an initial set of YAML that was there to, to kind of help describe that. And so in engaging in that working group, um, this is kind of rolled into something that we can give a term to and, and hopefully roll into the, the CNCF and you know, have, have broad participation. And I think part of the goals here are that if there is value found, um, which uh, that that this unit of that this common way of measuring, a common way of describing the environment and what you're doing, will be um, that you would find either implementations of it in each uh, participating service mesh, or that, uh, that there's a canonical implementation of SMP today um, inside of the meshery project, which uh, hopefully will would go the same route, would um, come into the CNCF shortly as well. Um, 
uh, that either the service meshes themselves are implementing this spec or that they're maybe they're running meshery in their pipelines to be able to perform some of the things that Nick had just said around um, reg you know, um, regression analysis of performance with each, each build or with each release and doing so in a consistent manner. Um, yeah. Okay. Just, this is maybe going too far off topic, but do you see this as a standalone sandbox project eventually or nested in with SMI or something else or is that a big TBD conversation? Uh, it, it, I think the intention is a, as a standalone sandbox project okay. um, to the extent that um, there's a, boy, my wife hates it when I use this term, but there's a smidge of an overlap. Um, I'm with the, you there. The overlap being um, in the best of ways of like um, the very simple examples of if in SMP, if you're going to say, hey, the, the service mesh that's being measured is... Kuma, as a random example, um, in SMP, it's a collect currently it's a collection of proto files, and, and in there it has names of meshes. If there is an SMI proto file, which which there isn't, but if there was a common way of uh, describing the fact that that this thing this thing represents Kuma, great, the two can use the same moniker to identify that mesh. Um, but yeah, they're, they're you know re really complementary, and to the extent that that helps, um, that would be great. But... Leo, the... go ahead, Kevin. Uh, thanks. Uh, does the service mesh performance toolset currently make use of uh, SMI's metric uh, implementation, or is that a planned? thing or is it are the two just they just don't meet at all um, they, they do actually you can kind of see Nick's um, head going up and down which is um, a little bit to the example that I was giving around like traffic splitting is that um, is that one 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 configures the environment and the other mm -hmm. one um, can you know measures it um, the uh, of what SP is today is a is a specification or it's a, there's a reference implementation of that specification right. in the Meshery tool. And Meshery um, does implement SMI. It also, it does both. It's, it speaks to the service meshes um, directly as needed, but it'll also leverage SMI um, to the extent that it can. As a matter of, yeah. As a matter of fact, it, I think that answers it, yeah. And actually, sort of uh, to to Nick's prior uh, the SMI conformance uh, bit of the work stream, like yeah, but, but Meshery is very much so aligned with the goals of SMI in terms of uh, helping helping validate it. Good good questions. I think I'm on the wrong. I'm sharing the wrong deck. It's too many decks. So, Lee, I have a quick question about SMP. Who submits the performance? Is it uh, the SMP working group, or is it a work stream, or is it uh, a project, or who who does the actual uh, calculation of the benchmark? Yep, yeah, good question. So, the I'm trying to uh, bear with me one second, Steve. I'm trying to mm -hmm. get make sure I'm. Yeah, uh, this is the. Um, so, so the, uh, how do I SM, SMP itself a collection of proto files? The implement the first implementation of it has been in Meshery. Meshery as a tool will um, well. Here, here's a kind of a good example. If we can use this example, so when Meshery um, and, and this is the, the each of these projects, by the way, they are intentionally like uh, mid-flight uh, or they're being presented mid-flight so that folks can influence. Um, and so I, I caveat that to say that um, the way that Meshery is providing um, conformance today is it, it's running a, a suite, it, it asserts a bunch of tests, uh, it makes a bunch of assertions, runs a bunch of tests, provisions um, up to eight different um, service meshes, uh, tries to ascertain whether or not they're compliant with um, the SMI spec, 
and bundles up those test results and will um, and, and has the ability to uh, persist those, send those off remotely or just persist them locally. And so I use that as an example of kind of the same way in which it has, it implements SMP is that at, and actually the next discussion, actually maybe this is a good to kind of roll into the next um, project because there'll be a demo of this. Um, the way that uh, Meshery implements SMP is to describe the environment, capture the detail, you know, do the thing that SMP does, but also to run load tests, collect the, the results, do some statistical analysis, and it, it'll have it'll collect that test result in an SMP described format, which it can also send back and persist. Um, as uh, as hopefully both SMP and Meshery go into the CNCF, one of the things that Meshery has been doing is for those that have been running it, and again, our hope is that each of the service meshes that find value in it will run it in their uh, pipelines, that it would not only send, transmit back SM, SMI conformance um, for, of that um, mesh, but also send back um, uh, performance tests or S SMP um, formatted test results. So therein live, I think part of the answer to your question, which is like, hey, who's, um, one of the things that w w the, the vision for Meshery as a project has been, and, and a lot of people have asked like, hey, where's, where's the performance analysis? Like, where's that paper published? And the group has been really hesitant to do that because you, a lot of times you end up making an ass out of, every, out of yourself and everyone else. Cause, and, and rather we try to give people tooling to let them go do the analysis themselves as we use, potentially use the CNCF lab to run some of those analyses, analyses, we would want, we would call for participation from each of the service meshes to ensure that things are configured in the right way, that we're um, getting as apples to apples as is even possible, which isn't entirely possible. At, um, but that rather it's the service mesh manufacturers or the projects themselves that are empowered with the same tool using the same a common format to send in those reports or keep the reports if they want to, it's, you know, or both. Thanks, Lee. Yeah, good, 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 good. Um, well, good, let's get it. And actually, I hope that the, there's a little bit of a demo here that will help um, follow on Steve's questions. So, um, Kush, there's uh, some distributed performance analysis that you've been working on in combination with a couple of the uh, Envoy Nighthawk maintainers. Do you want, you want to tell folks about this? So the problem was that many performance benchmark tools or analysis tools are limited to single instance load generation or single pod load generators. So this limits the amount of traffic that can be generated to the output of the single machine that the benchmark tool runs on in the cluster or out of the cluster. Distributed load testing in parallel was just a challenge when merging results. And like we need to maintain some of, we need to ensure some certain factors like we don't need to lose the precisions and we also need to gain insights on high yield percentiles. So we carried out this project forward and the project was proposed at the, as a Google Summer of Code idea for CNCF. Summer of code acted as a catalyst to execute the project. So <coughs> the project didn't only enable us to have distributed performance benchmarking, but as we know that different microservices behave differently in uh, different workloads and exhibit different signatures. So the project will also enable us to understand like how different microservices will exhibit the characteristics and different workloads. So for the project, we collaborated with Nighthawk maintainers. Nighthawk is a layer seven performance characterization tool which was created by Envoy team. And hopefully it's going to support distributed performance, distributed load generation soon. And we took Meshri, Meshri which is a service mesh management plane and which currently supports WRK2, Fort.io and Nighthawk as single instance load generators. So, we invoke Nighthawk into Meshri as a, with a 
help of an external library, which was created by us, namely Go Nighthawk. The library acted as a middleware to consolidate the implementation of Nighthawk into Mishri. Here is the link of design spec in the slides where you can see how the complete idea is proposed and how the plan of action is carried forward. So this is a design mockup, which is right now for the interface. Users will have ability to choose between single instance load generation and multi instance load generation. We have also given a choice of load generators to choose from for Dio, WRK2, and Nighthawk. You will also have ability to process the results and you can compare different results and benchmark analysis with each other. And the service mesh performance spec, which Lee was just talking about and Nick Jackson explained it briefly. So in the machinery results, we have also implemented a canonical, a canonical implementation of service mesh, service mesh performance spec. So I'll just show you a quick demo of how <coughs> the load generation takes place. I hope my screen is visible. It is. So let's just quickly name a test. Here we need to specify any URL. Different, there is some, all the different load generators behave differently with the DNS entries and the IP versions of DNS entries of the URLs which we have given for the test. So different load generators sometimes may give a different results and different benchmark analysis. So here is the result, which we just got from the load test, which we ran on the website, google.com and using the load generator in talk. If I will just navigate into the results tab, I can see there are a variety of results and I can just select some of the results and I can, I can see a quick comparison between the results. And moreover, we have the canonical implementation of service mesh performance spec. So if you will just click on download, you will see you'll see the performance results which uh, are which are gathered in the format of the specification which we Lee and Nick was talking about. Yeah, that, that's, that's very nice. One of the things that, Kush, I noticed in your demo, you, you hit a server, an endpoint that wasn't on a, a service mesh, which is maybe a good call out that um, that's one of the first things that people want to understand is like, hey, what is what are the performance characteristics or the differences between running my service on the mesh and off the mesh, which is, which is kind of nice um, to be able to do. Um, you were noting um, some of the differences in the, um, well, al algorithms, I guess is what I would say, the statistical analysis that um, each of those load generators use, um, a bit of the, a difference in the way in which they might generate load as well. Boy, I'm going to forget the actual, the term here. So none of those load generators are the type of load generators that um, academics like to use. As a matter of fact, um, Mr. Sahu Pratik um, it has been collaborating in this, these, this area for a while. I just noticed Pratik is on a PhD candidate at UT Austin. Pratik, help me with the type of load generator that I'm trying hey, to- Hey, uh, yeah, Haley. Uh, so, uh... There are two types of load generators that uh, we look at, like the open loop load generators and closed loop. So like just to see how much can we push the servers, uh, uh, usually open loop load generators is what we at academics uh, like to focus on, but most of these load generators are 
closed loop load generators which uh, rely on the response uh, how many uh, did they uh, send out a request only when a response is received per thread and uh, that is I, I believe that is the distinction that Lee is uh, mentioning yeah um, it is and if, yeah if I recall off the top of my head uh, you know like hey there's a reason why there's there was WRK and now there's WRK2. I think the difference in it, um, being like um, coordinated omission uh, is part of like um, how the different load generators perform in terms of being open or closed. And then also in terms of how they um, assess, you know, uh, uh, do their analysis from when they start measuring to when they don't and, and so. Anyway, that's being done today in a single, um, from a single load perspective. And uh, part of what Kush and the Nighthawk maintainers that he's engaging with are working on distributed analysis, which I think will unlock, and, and I think Patik does as well, and the others that are involved, um, unlock, unlock some new insights. I mean, we're we're you know, now in a world where we're running lots of microservices. Uh, a popular microservice might, uh, enjoy a lot more use than it anticipated, particularly um, some east-west traffic that it wasn't, um, you know, maybe wasn't designed, it wasn't initially designed for. Uh, so I'm, I'm excited to see, like, to enable people with easy-to-use tooling and a standard um, measurement mechanism for understanding that and characterizing it. So. Comments. So was that, was that an example of a distributed load test? Were we running multiple Nighthawks from multiple clients? Okay. Yeah. No. No. Um, the and so true. True to what I no is the simple answer, which is uh, I'm glad you asked. Um, each of the projects are, like I would say, the, the project that that Kush and Pratik were just speaking to are, is 50% of the way there, if you will. Uh, so either an excellent time to present to get influence from from Mitch and others, or or maybe not the best of times to present until it's all done. It depends on, for our part, um, these, are, these projects are like, whoever has come to bear and come to influence and provide insight has been, I hope, you know, like really warmly welcomed and so. You know, no, it's that, good. No, it's a work in progress. That's great. One of, actually, Mitch, um, just as you, just putting your, forcing you to put an Istio hat on, um, the, one thing that would be insightful, both toward the service mesh patterns that we were uh, talking about on the start of the call and here is like, uh, boy, the, and I, this isn't favoritism, I, this is a fact because I've spoken with every single service mesh that's out there. And I can prattle more off than you can, <laughs> anyway, um, that the, the, is the, well, the former performance and scalability working group had their crap together, so to speak, or like had, uh, you know, in combination with um, some of the folks at IBM and, and Google and, and others that would, would come in there, had a number of uh, benchmark, common benchmark, common tests and things that they would look for, uh, whether it was X number of envoys or this many namespaces or this, a lot of things that have much bigger scale than I think that, well, certainly than those that have been working on this tool have. And that's in part our aim toward the CNCF um, use of the CNCF labs is to be able to do some things. My point is um, there are, there's a lot of knowledge um, from within that working group um, that uh, particularly just like, hey, here's, here's the type of test that should be run. And, and part of that's like, like I'd said, some of the examples as I'd said, or, or part of that is based on workload type, it might be the same exact test, but it's a different type of workload. Uh, a lot of the people that we've engaged in this project have like a very common question is, well, yeah, but so like, what are you using as your example workload? Are you like, and Pratik will bring up the, like, hey, are you running a, an instance of GitLab's infrastructure, for example, or, or some social network or some database heavy thing or some, and um, anyway, to the, to, to the notion that we're only halfway through, um, getting influence from others about what types of easily repeatable tests there should be is would be really helpful. 
Yeah, I, I think the number one thing that, that I would take away from the work that the telemetry group did on regarding performance, which is now being kind of folded into the test and release working group, but uh, it is that the details are very important. Um, so looking at that YAML file, it, it's possible that these fields exist, but that they're just not populated. But it would be great to be able to annotate it with information about the details of the test. You know, this was being run with MTLS enabled or MTLS disabled or Auth Z policies, and it was run against this type of a client application. Uh, being able to track that from one test to the next, then you get the ability to say, hey, when I kept all of the details the same but only changed MTLS, here was the impact of that one minor change. Each on, I, I think that's the only like um, yes, absolutely. The and that is uh, the example that Kush had just shown was like it was a 15 liner or something. That's it. That's sure. um, showing that like of what's defined in the spec today um, is what's a good example is a bit more of exactly what you're um, highlight, highlighting, which is like which is exactly why there's tooling being why we're investing in tooling being built is because. Is because good God, I, I think performance engineers don't get paid enough because yeah, there's any number of, there's their litany of, uh, you know, did, what, did you have an egress gateway or not? Or did you have an ingress? And then how big was it? And then and just like to your point, like, you know, any variation in, in any number of these vari variables um, really has an impact. Maybe it's- so uh, I was just going to say real quick, I think it's great that you're getting people together to work on this. There was sort of a lack of interest in Istio and performance analysis. I mean, we reached a certain point where uh, like most of the, the performance uh, tuning was in Envoy itself. So uh, the, that we dissolved that work group um, because there was a lack of interest. It was like two people would show up and they talk to each other and so they sign up for a work group. But you know, if there's 25 people involved, that might be, you might get more out of that. So I think that, I think this is great. Thank you. You know, Lee, to that point, uh, do we expect to see substantially different performance numbers from different Envoy-based service mesh implementations? That's a good, uh, that's a good question. Yeah, I, uh, well, I won't name, I won't name names. I had that conversation a few times. My gosh, like a year and a half ago. Um, maybe I would just say, um, I would maybe put it like this, like, hey, within the control plane, does, does having Mixer in the control plane or not make a difference in terms of, I guess it's a rhetorical question, I guess. Um, I think this, I, don't, I think just add, I think this could be something which might be more um, for the future because Envoy is, is obviously currently opening up extension points inside with, with um, WASM, WASM filters, which are running in the hot path. And once folks have got control to, to in effect, change the operability of, of Envoy, you, you probably will see a greater variance in, in the various different service meshes, depending on which filters they use or how they use them. And, and I think um, one of the common things around that at the moment that you might see, which is slightly different, is, is things like X, um, sorry, XAuth. Because um, XAuth is a call out, and then you've got things like rate limiting, which again is a call out. But... I think that the variation will probably grow as Envoy becomes more more um, extensible outside of the core code base. That makes sense. Thank you. And then, yeah. and, then and then Mitch, actually, I'm curious for your feedback on what I was alluding to around like uh, one control plane not being necessarily the equivalent of the other. Um, and I'd mentioned. Um, or just like, you know, to the extent that um, Mixer is, was doing a lot and is still doing a lot, but in a different area, like from your perspective, uh, you know, I mean, like, yeah, as a, yeah, I'd had an early conversation with um, product manager for AppMesh and, and I think that was their same perspective. It was like, oh, well, you know, it's just uh, Envoy data plane. So what's the, it's like, well, the control plane is a, has a you know dep depends on what you're doing and, and so yeah no i think i think highlighting that that wasm will really be a game changer in terms of comparative performance makes a lot of sense if all we're doing is serving simple xds listeners endpoints i would not expect to see uh, 
I would hope to not see a substantial difference between the two. Uh, those APIs are r relatively tight in terms of their implementations. But uh, yeah, Wasm's a, a whole new frontier in terms of performance. So that makes sense. And I don't know about other service meshes, but at least in Istio, Wasm is becoming a part of the de facto or like the, the default implementation of the data plane will have Wasm filters loaded. Uh, so seeing performance difference there makes a lot of sense. Blake, I won't necessarily speak on behalf of uh, console's roadmap, but unless you will. Uh, thanks for putting me on the spot, Lee. I think I'll just add that that is something that we are looking at, like the other service meshes that are out there. I think you see a big opportunity uh, for Wasm to um, uh, allow users to and operators to do things above and beyond what we as a vendor have built into the, the product. So there's a um, big potential there from an extensibility standpoint, but it's something that we're keeping our eye on. And obviously that ecosystem's early and, and maturing, um, but I think as it matures, you know, we will look at what opportunities we have to incorporate that into console. Very good. And then published, what's today, the third? So published yesterday, it was a Linkerd blog talking about kind of the road ahead for Linkerd2 proxy. Um, turns out, turns out Wasm is a popular thing. So kind of number four on the list was, you know. Um, I'm, um, I'm personally looking forward to the day when all my application code is going into the service meshes Wasm and I don't actually have any microservices whatsoever. I just have proxies and Wasm modules. Watch, watch this KubeCon 2024 for the horror story by Company X, which says why we thought putting all our business logic into Wasm was a really bad idea. And now we suffered the majorest outage of our lives. But people will still do it. Yeah, they will. And this is important. This is like, for my, for my personal perspective, um, this is in part why we've been investing a ton of time into this, this space, because I think that there's a bunch of um, application infrastructure code. Like we talk about service meshes um, taking care of uh, infrastructure concerns. And I think there's a lot of parallels between service serverless things and service mesh things. And there's a, there's a very similar value proposition. Service meshes, um, I think, speak really well to uh, absolving applications of some of those lower level considerations and going forward there's even some like i would i would quote it as like application infrastructure there's a lot of so nick mentioned um, x auth before like there's a lot of uh a lot of commonality in in application infrastructure users t tenants um price plans uh, a lot of things that you need around the actual business logic that you're trying to achieve, or um, that some of those things, the uh, service mesh or a, an intelligent data plane filter, or they're already looking at that header and they're already, you know, so, so as people go to explore that and they go to prepare for their 2024 talk, that they might be able to have a common um, vernacular to describe that they might have easy to use tooling to test that. And so. I, I'm very excited about Wasm. I, I think it's, it's going to present an incredible opportunity. I think there's a lot of fears around, is it going to be the next ESB? I, I would argue that the ESB was actually probably not the world's worst pattern. It was more so the implementation that, that was wrong about the ESB. But, but parking that aside, I think one of the, the, the really interesting opportunities is when we start looking at security. And one of the kind of the core competencies of service mesh is the ability to do micro segmentation. Now, the kind of the concepts behind why we need to do that is because the firewall as a perimeter is not the um, not not as successful a form of defense as as, as we we who had all hoped. There's uh, ways around it. I have like a crazy vision of somebody building like a micro distributed WAF, which would run as like an Envoy plugin filter the ability to do kind of individual request level inspection on an east to west base rather than just on that pure north south and 
And when you start to kind of like think about that as becoming a norm, I think you really, really start to need to be thinking about being able to, to accurately measure and, and um, sort of consistently sort of reproduce uh, the measurement of tests and things like that. Lee, you mentioned the cost of running control planes. Uh, and Nick, I think you referred to that as well. Are the, right now, the results that we saw today, we're talking about latency on the traffic, which is probably the number one concern of most service mesh users is what sort of latency characteristics are they going to see? Are we going to see also execution cost in terms of CPU and memory for the data plane and control plane? So Pratik, Mr. Mr. Uh, I, I, um, yeah, the short answer, Mitch, is that's absolutely, we, um, Pratik just presented on that at, at uh, KubeCon um, EU. Um, there's a few early results from some of his, his research up, because yeah, I think that that's, uh, I think actually being able to articulate that in a granular way so that people can make decisions on whether or not to take a sprint of the dev team or a couple of sprints to go do the thing that you might otherwise do with a filter. Like part of that decision, or well, hopefully part of that decision is, you know, what, is, what does it cost us over here? What does it cost us over there? And so, yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate all the, the questions today. This has been a um, it's been really nice. People got to go. Uh, please signal your interest in the Slack channel or on the mailing list or um, or any which way you want to. Um, we'll try to um, organize a bit, um, get some things going asynchronously about uh, providing a place to put in thoughts and comments and and bring your influence. But. Um, I'm looking forward to this. I hope that this is uh, uh, as vendor neutral as we can get or as uh, toward the end user as we can get. And it's actually in part we're creating this because there is an end user service mesh working group talking about patterns. And, um, and they're having all the fun by themselves. Um, they they, they you know, don't want the vendors over there. And, uh, and that's all right but then the vendors aren't working on the patterns and the feedback that they need. And so, yeah, we need to work on those. Yeah, thanks guys, this looks great. Thank you all. Talk to you soon, see you guys.